Welcome back to the second part of Rides of Civilization Guide, where we will be talking about the combat aspect of the game. If you haven't seen the first part of the video, be sure to check it out and hopefully you will learn some tricks to gain an easy, efficient head start among your friends or any other player in your kingdom. When it comes to battles and wars in general, you need a strong troop. A troop here is defined as a unit of commanders and multiple soldiers. If you have a primary commander that has at least 3 stars, that commander can bring along another commander and is also known as a secondary commander. You can get commanders from events, collecting commander sculpture, and from opening silver or gold chests. Each commander has unique abilities and with the recent update, depending on the type of commander, they are allowed to unlock certain talents. Note that only the talents of the primary commander will be taken into account in the event of the troop having two commanders, whereas the abilities of both commanders will still apply. There are many types of commanders and there are many categories, but just for the sake of simplifying this video, Let's separate them into combat commanders and gathering commanders. There are many benefits of having two commanders, even if it's for gathering resources. If both commanders have ability to gather faster, it will stack and allow you to complete resource camps very quickly. In the combat side of things, having two commanders allow a second active skill to trigger right after the primary commander's skill. This means more damage and if you are using a support type commander, your troops can be buffed or healed. You will get to implement one extra star on your commander for every 10 levels. So the commander can be made two stars at level 10 and three stars at level 20, so on. But there is a trick that you can go from 1 star to 3 stars at level 10 and this by abusing the critical chance when bringing it from 1 star to 2 star. Every time you use the starlight sculpture to increase the star count, there is a chance for a critical that gives double points. The more starlight sculpture you use, the higher it is the chance of critical. So what you want to do is put 2 starlight sculpture at first and that will give you 40% and if it crits, that will give you 80% but not 100% because once you hit 100%, you can no longer add sculptures. If it didn't crit, then you'll need to put in another starlight sculpture and that will give you from 40% to 60% or if that single one were to crit, then that will give you 80% but again, not 100% yet. And for the last step, you just need to put as many starlight sculpture as you can and that should give you about 60% critical chance and you will get from 60% or 80% to more than 200% if it crits, giving you 3 stars at only level 10. Note that for every star that you get, you will also unlock an ability or skill. This is a cool trick, but I do not advise you doing this to all of your commanders because it dilutes your skill pool such that if you have very good first and second ability that you want to max out early, you might end up spending a lot more sculptures because of some of those random skill ups might go to your third ability instead. So you do not want to do this especially if you have a very useful first and second ability. Most commanders that is a combat type has a very useful first ability that you might want to max out first before even getting the second star. For an example is that in one of my account, I have a Cleopatra that has a very good first ability as a support skill but because I have unlocked 3 stars on this commander at level 10, after 5 skill ups, I only managed to get his first ability at level 2 since the sculpture for this commander is really hard to get. I am stuck having her first ability that low, else I could have had it at level 5 which I would much prefer. I hope that makes sense to you. The next thing we're going to talk about is the training camps, namely the barracks to train infantry, the archer range to train archer, stable for cavalries, and workshop for sieges. You can learn about them by clicking the information icon next to each different soldier. But the main idea here is that infantries are good against cavalries but bad against archers. Archers are good against infantries but bad against cavalries. Cavalry which is good against archers but bad against infantry. And siege which is good at damaging watchtowers but weak against infantry, archers, and cavalry. So that's the basic structure of the strengths and weaknesses of each soldier type. The strength of the troop depends on the commander in use and the amount of soldiers you put in. The higher level your commander is, the more soldiers it can accommodate, the stronger the troop as a unit. Just as a rough idea, your soldiers are like bullets and the commander is like the gun which control the magazine size. In general, you just want to keep training whenever you can and if you feel like you have too many soldiers, you upgrade them instead. One of the common questions I hear people asking regarding the 
upgrading of soldiers is that should they do it or should they just train more higher tier soldiers? The higher the tier of the soldier, the more time it takes to train. For example, you can train 300 tier 1 soldiers in an hour or 150 tier 2 soldiers in an hour or 75 tier 3 soldiers per hour. If you were to upgrade a tier 1 soldier to tier 2, you can do it in a rate of 300 soldiers per hour. From tier 2 to tier 3, it is 150 soldiers per hour. And from tier 1 all the way to tier 3 is 100 soldiers per hour. If you run the numbers, you will see that it actually is the same. To get 300 new tier 3 soldiers, it will take you 4 hours. To upgrade 300 tier 1 soldiers, it will take you 3 hours. But if you include the initial time to create that 300 tier 1 soldiers, which is 1 hour, it comes down to 4 hours as well. And this goes the same with upgrading from tier 2 to tier 3. But if you think about it, since you already have the tier 1 units, upgrading them is like training tier 3 units or higher from the start. With that said, having extra tier 1 and tier 2 soldiers aren't that bad since the time taken to create them in respect to the load that they could carry is much better than the time needed to create a tier 3 for gathering purposes. But if your commander has a low troop capacity, it makes sense that you want to fill it with higher tier soldiers. And the last factor that you want to consider is your hospital capacity. You don't want to have too many tier 1 soldiers that in a war, your hospital gets so easily filled that your soldiers does not have space and die. In my opinion, having enough soldiers for two full sets of troops and some for gathering would be enough for the majority of the early and mid game. Now when you really look at battles or war, the game benefits defensive play over aggressive and offensive playstyle. The reason why is because of the fact that when you are defending in your structure, may it be a city, flag, or fortress, enemies that attack you and get severely injured may die while your troops that are hurt in the same battle only ends up in the hospital. It is true that healing your troops will cost you resources, but retraining troops will cost, again more importantly, time. In return for being offensive, if you were to successfully attack an enemy city with high resources, you will be able to plunder some of that, but in a way, it becomes a trade between resources for the dead soldiers which will cost you training time. Not really worth it in my opinion because if you are not a cash user, there is only a limited amount of troops you can train per day. But then of course, it also depends on how many resources we are talking about I guess. This is also why it's very important that if you want to attack an enemy, make sure you could overwhelm them enough to take lesser damage. This is due to one of the game's combat mechanic which is quite realistic in my opinion. Basically, if you have let's say 10 soldiers and you were to attack another person with 11 exact soldiers, you will probably lose but your enemies may have one or two soldiers left. But if you have 50 soldiers and you are fighting with someone that has only 10 soldiers, you will win with maybe only 5 injured units. So the more you overwhelm the enemy, the more damage you will do and the faster their troops weaken, which also means the lesser damage you will take. To know if you could win, always scout on the enemy before you attack. It would be a waste to have your troops die without fulfilling their objective. With that said, battles that occur outside of structures, for example the field or even resource camps, the injured soldiers are all sent back to hospital. So a simple yet effective way of fighting between alliances is to place a single point flag for the enemy to focus on and reinforce that flag until the enemies exhaust their troops and that's when you strike back. But a smart leader wouldn't attack aimlessly either. The right way to take over a flag is to send troops surrounding the flag to prevent reinforcement while starting a winning rally if there's any enemies inside of the flag and then send the rest of the troops to surround the flag to prevent any further enemies from entering. As you may have guessed, teamwork and communication is very important in these fights which is why many alliances are grouped with their own nationalities. But that also means that they are within the same time zone and majority would will be offline during sleeping hours or working hours. An international alliance on the other hand will have people on constantly but they are almost never at their 100%. Of course, there are many ways to win the war, including creating decoys and making allies so that you do not have to fight alone. But in general, this is the basic direct method that you would want to go about. Remember that before you could attack the enemy's flag or fortress, you will need to link your territory to that flag or fortress first. 
When you attack an enemy alliance structure, it will start to burn. Only the burn damage can hurt these walls. And what you want is to keep it burning for as long as you can. Hit it again if it ever stops burning and that is how you destroy an enemy structure. Individual cities, fortresses, and flag takes 2 damage per second and depending on the upgrades and buff it has, it may take minutes to hours to break. Flags are usually a lot faster with only 2000 initial health, it will take up to 17 minutes of burning. A fortress on the other hand with let's say 90,000 health, it will take more than half a day to break. When setting up your troops, there could be some benefits in having similar soldier types due to certain buff by certain commander's ability and talents. So it depends a lot on which commander you are running and how he is built. There are some commanders that are actually better with mixed soldier types as well. A good example and a popular example for having similar soldier types is the cavalry movement speed build. They can be crazy annoying since you cannot outrun them and at the same time you cannot chase them down. This is due to the movement speed buff from cavalrys, their commander abilities and talents. But to be training on one specific soldier type can be very time consuming and expensive to make especially in the early games. The movement of your troops is not really flexible. It takes some getting used to, you cannot move to a certain position by clicking on an area, you can only move towards a target and this could be either a resource camp, barbarians or maybe an enemy. You have to be creative and use that to position yourself which could be a little challenging. Another thing to note is that if you're moving towards an enemy with your troops or even with scouts, your enemy will be alerted the entire duration while you march closer. So if you really want to surprise your enemy, you should find a way to get closer before actually attacking them. Now I've been mostly talking about PvP, although PvE is important, but you do not really find yourself in trouble by failing to fight some barbarians. However, a few days after a kingdom is being created, there should be an event in which you can farm for Lothar. Lothar is one of the best jungler or peacekeeper because of his abilities to deal more damage to barbarians. If you can, try to get as many Lothar sculptures during this event for this is a great free commander for PvE. You consume action points when you send your troops to fight barbarians and it will cost lesser points the more barbarians you kill in one go. You can actually deploy a few troops at once on the same barbarians and all of those troops will get loot and experience as if they killed it themselves. Every troop deploy will cost action points, however this can allow your troops to take less damage overall and stay on the field longer. There are a few reasons you would want to kill barbarians or guardians. It could be for an event or mission, for experience or their loots which also includes arrow of resistance that is used to upgrade your watchtower. If you are not strong enough, you could get your friends and alliance member to kill guardians together by ganging up on them. For your city's defenses, we have the watchtower, the garrisons with their abilities, and the troops in your city to contribute in the damage you deal on enemies who attack you. The garrisons are commanders that you pick for your defense behind the structure. When it comes to flag, fortresses, or paths, the commanders of the first troop that reinforces is automatically made the garrison. This is why strong garrisons should be the first to reinforce these structures, and the other members just need to try and reinforce as many high tier soldiers as possible. As a united unit consisting of many troops like a rally or when reinforcing, whenever the unit is hurt there will be vacancy available and even if it is full before, you can now send more troops in. Do note that some reinforcement like the one on ally cities or a battling rally can only accept one unit of troops from each player, even if it has space after it has taken a lot of damage. Here is a battle demonstration of us taking down the tier 2 pass by reinforcing our rally over and over again. That is pretty much it for this part of the video. Whether or not there will be more guides in the future really depends on how well these videos are received and if I should continue talking about this game. Let me know in the comments if there is any important or interesting information that you think I should have included or missed out. Please like and subscribe if you feel like you have learned something. Feel free to share it with your friends or alliance members to help them help you become stronger. I hope to see you guys again soon. Have a pleasant day.